Well, hello. It's the height of summer here at Fabled Farms, and what a lovely time to be in the garden. After months of fastidious feeding, pruning, and watering, the roses are finally bursting forth with their majestic blossom. The deer fence, did we forget to shut the gate? You, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it just takes one time, doesn't it? Yeah, thorns and all. Mm hmm yeah, they love them. I love those roses. Let's go down to the vegetable patch. The sun-ripened heirloom tomatoes will be bursting forth now with the most glorious <coughs> gophers. Go we, we have to set the gopher traps. I mean, I know they're cute. I know, but if you, we do, I mean, they just, they take the whole plant. They took the whole tomato plant. Let's go see the perennial border. Something else that I adore houseplants. Mm -hmm. Hey everyone, I'm Andy. Welcome to the season two premiere of Furniture Fables. For as long as they have known just how happy many plants can be living in containers and with indoor temperatures, people have delighted in the hobby of indoor gardening. Perhaps now more than ever, interest has really blossomed. Last year, sales of houseplants skyrocketed, and it's not hard to see why. There is a type and size of houseplant to suit just about any domicile, from the tiniest single desk plant to rather large and impressive trees. So how does furniture redesign connect into this? Well, those plants need containers, of course, which can be anything from a plastic cup to a gorgeous glazed ceramic, but there is something extra special about the repurposed furniture planter and I had been dreaming of just such a repurpose for a long time. When I saw this intriguing little beauty of a console, my marketplace scrolling screeched to a stop. While I had been thinking I would try my idea with something a bit smaller, this console table with its curves, its carved floral detailing, and beveled mirror set my imagination ablaze with possibilities. The fact that it was made by Ethan Allen wasn't bad either, and so I scooped it for the asking $10. The owner explained that originally the piece had had a marble top, but that unfortunately the top was broken during their move, Hearing of broken marble is enough to make this furniture enthusiast choke back some tears, but I knew that tragedy must have meant our destinies were fated to intertwine. I began, as I always do, hot water with plenty of Dawn dishwashing suds, and a good scouring pad and brush. I do occasionally clean with a TSP product, when I feel a lot of polish buildup, or if a piece is particularly dirty, but also when I need to clean indoors. <laughs> this very organic, shall we say, cleaning technique obviously only works when you have an outdoor space and the right weather to do it in. And of course, the same with rinsing the piece with the hose, which you will see in a second here. It is really important to note that the only reason I can get away with doing this, so to speak, is because of not only how warm it is right now where we live, but how dry. It is not just easy to get the furniture dry. I couldn't keep it damp if I tried. Remember, water in and of itself doesn't hurt the wood. It's water that stays, collects, or pools somewhere and doesn't fully dry out that can eventually be absorbed and start to cause all sorts of issues. This piece was in amazing shape. No dings, scratches, or dents. Sometimes you just get lucky like that, but its factory smooth finish would not be ideal for painting. So I got out a 220 sanding disc and gave the console a good scuff up. Then I wiped back all that dust with a microfiber cloth and a little water.
recently I had put in an order to a relatively new paint company on the scene. Melange Paints is a self-described mom and pop paint making shop in the Houston, Texas area. Every batch of their paint is hand poured into their eco-friendly glass jars. Their water-based, low VOC, self-priming and self-leveling paints with their incredible creaminess and incredible color palette have already delighted and impressed many folks in the furniture painting community. I picked out four contrasting colors to try and was already itching to use them just looking at them in the jars. So when I finally found the right furniture piece for my little idea, I knew I wanted to use the color patchouli green. With patchouli basically translating as green leaf, this color seemed like the obvious choice. And as I opened it with the beautiful reflection of the mighty California oaks looking kindly on, I felt pretty certain I had made the right choice. Melange paints contain a self primer, but I often prime anyway when using paints that do. But as I mentioned before, I didn't have to use a drop of wood filler on this console table and I just kind of had a hunch it wasn't going to bleed. But just in case, I did do a little test on one of the feet and then waited an hour or so before just plunging ahead. Here's a little caveat about bleed through, which is of course when those natural tannin oils in wood get activated by paint or any other product that has water in it and can come up to the surface and literally bleed through your paint. Bleed through can technically happen days or even weeks after painting. So while a test spot will probably reveal if a piece will have issues with bleed through, there is a chance that it won't. But like I said, this was a new paint for me and whenever I can, I love to try to use a new paint without a primer. I feel like I can just get a better sense of how the paint brushes on, how it lays down, and it's just overall texture and coverage. As I worked on my first coat, I saw right away what the fuss was all about. This paint was having great first coat coverage over this medium dark finish, and it just felt great coming off the brush. Melange recommends natural bristle brushes for their paint, but also says that Zebra brushes work really well, and so you can see I am using my trusty Zebra Chiseled Wedge, and it's doing a great job managing all the twists and turns and corners and grooves and details of this very cool piece. Oh, this color. So I am definitely a little finicky when it comes to greens. And even though it's tough to truly judge a color until you've completely covered a piece and done two coats, I'll admit, I started to fall in love. This is not a khaki or silver toned green. It has a real freshness or crunch to it. If I were to use non-plant based descriptive words, I would perhaps call it a deep beach glass green. And yet there is a calm undertone to it there was nothing harsh or unnatural. A very good green. I let that first coat dry for about two and a half hours and then came back to start my second coat. I was really impressed with the coverage of those two coats with no primer. I did not need a third coat. After that coat dried, it was finally time to construct my planter. I measured the interior of the console top and then marked off where to make my cuts of the plywood piece I had purchased from the Home Depot.
I tested that freshly cut piece and it was looking pretty good because the console top had two block joiners in the front corners. My saw buddy here gave me a little refresh on using the jigsaw and together we cut the two notches needed to fit the board into the table. Romantic, right? <laughs> I did another fit test and then grabbed my Surf Prep Electric Ray sander with a coarse grit paper and gave those edges a quick sanding and then it fit perfectly. There we go. No worries about those little bits of daylight coming through. We will take care of them. No sweat. I grabbed a whole mess of L brackets and a couple different lengths of screws. It's important to check the length so that they don't come through your piece or that plywood, which is a different thickness. And then with John's help again, I checked the level of that bottom and then pre-drilled my screw holes and attached my L brackets into place. I decided to use two brackets on the short sides, five along the back, and three in the front. John told me he thought I had gone a little overboard on how many I did, but I wanted to make sure that this piece was nice and solid and could support a good amount of weight. Then I used a little bit of leftover caulking sealer we had in the garage and applied a liberal amount all along those edge seams, pushing the material in and down with my finger after I had dampened it with a little bit of water, and then coming along with a damp paper towel to wipe up the excess. By the way, sometimes folks will ask me how or if I finish the bottom of pieces. I generally like to use the neat and tidy rule. If I don't need to paint the bottom completely, I don't because that takes up a good amount of paint. But I do like to finish off the bottom neatly in some way so that when it is loaded into a car and the customer sees that bottom, it looks neat and tidy. <laughs> I also gave the plywood a single coat of the patchouli just in case any of it might be visible in that mirror. Then I got out some Dixie Bell clear coat in flat and gave it a good stir. You can see how important it is to mix those solids back into the top coat. Melange has a top coat that will be available in September, according to their website, called Polyvine Wax Finish Varnish. And I'm really looking forward to trying that out. They describe it as having the silky feel of wax with the durability of varnish. But if you've seen any of my other fables, you know I'm a big fan of Dixie Bell's clear coat, and it was looking great with this color just again using my chiseled wedge brush to apply it. Sometimes folks get a little worried that liquid top coat will settle too much into carved details like this. You can see I'm applying it with the piece on its back even, but I find that as long as I gently brush out any large beads, it does a fantastic job leveling out even into those carved details. Okay, so I had had as part of my idea to use a little bit of Winter White Glaze by General Finishes. This is a water-based glaze that you can apply over raw or painted wood. I gave it a good stir and then tested some out on the bottom of the piece, brushing on a liberal amount and then wiping it back with a lint-free rag. I liked it enough to decide to give it a try on one side of the top of the piece. So I applied it there and then wiped it back and then looked at it and decided I needed to see it all along that front top. 
You can see I'm using my misting bottle. This is a water-based glaze, as I said, which is great. It makes it very easy to work with and kind of play around with. You can see I did not like how thickly I had applied the glaze into that front floret detail. And so I just literally sprayed it out with the misting bottle. So I was still unsure about whether or not I was liking the effect it was giving. So I tried the glaze over on one of those carved leaf details on the legs. Now I loved how these carved leaves looked with just the patchouli. They reminded me of cabbage leaves that Peter Rabbit might be munching on in Mr. McGregor's garden. <laughs> Applying the glaze brought out their shape, of course, but this winter white was starting to take the patchouli green in a decidedly minty direction. So I did one more leg. <laughs> what you are witnessing here, folks, is the artistic process. Sometimes you just have to put the dang glaze everywhere in order to know whether you like it or not. Once I did the whole dang piece, I stood back and looked. Ugh, what's a girl to do? What do you think? Are you a fan of this look? Is it possible to both like and dislike something all at once? I brought the piece up onto the front porch, hoping that some different lighting might make things clearer. And doing my best impression of the thinker, I stared at this poor console table for a bit more, and then... I got patchouli back out and painted over the glaze on that front piece. Immediately, I felt my shoulders relax and gave a deep sigh. I'm sorry if you were loving the effect of that glaze. Honestly, there was a lot I liked about it. But like I said, I had fallen in love with the patchouli in its pure form, and it made me so happy to see it return in all of its leafy green glory. Because both products are water-based, they can cover each other without any worries. It just meant a little more painting for me and less patchouli left over. I then used a little bit of Dixie Belle's toughest top coat, Gator Hide, to seal up the top edge, as well as the inside wall, and then I did two more coats of the clear coat in flat to reseal the newest paint job. Then I got out my enormous roll of plastic liner that I had picked up at the Home Depot, and I fit it into the new bed top of my table. Then I attached it using my staple gun, trimmed it up with my scissors, And then I was finally ready to plant. My friends, I have always dreamed of a planter just filled only with succulents. I filled the console bed with the cactus and succulent soil, smoothed it out, also kind of creating some natural small hills and valleys, and then started laying out all of the many, many succulents I had splurged on. <laughs> Yes, I said many, and I meant it. <laughs> Once my little babies were all safely planted, I opened my bag of pebbles and added them over the top of the soil. They will help keep the soil from spilling out, as well as helping to retain the water. And I think they'll look pretty too. Bet you thought I was done, right? there was one more idea I wanted to try out. So I gave the mirror a good cleaning and then I got out some stencils I had that I knew had several succulent and cactus shapes. I sorted through them, taking out the obvious ones that didn't go and then tried out this nice long one on the mirror. Ooh. <laughs> Making sure I got off all the excess, I used my top coat to paint the stencil onto the mirror. I 
I peeled it back and thought, well, that's big. So I tried a smaller stencil using the same techniques. And thought, that looks like a dog's nose print. I waited for it to dry to see what it would look like, but then decided, nah, and used my glass cleaner to take it right off. Then I tried this medium succulent, and you know what? It looked just right. I put one in each of the corners above the bevel in the mirror, and then I added one in the center. I just eyeballed it. I didn't get out my tape measure or anything. And then I added a succulent in between each of those so that I had a row of five. Usually we are trying to get products to stick, to stay, to adhere, but this mirror stencil isn't permanent, and that's actually great as far as I'm concerned. Okay, do you remember our unconsoled console who had lost its top, but not its potential, in search of a new job full of quality construction and imagination-sparking mojo? And here she is now. Oops, gotta give the babies one last drink. There we go. And here she is now. And here she is now. And here. Inside or out, welcome home, she says. Fresh and alive with new purpose and promise, our living console garden seems to have found that magical point where furniture, gardening, and creative whimsy converge. Her sparkling beveled mirror with stenciled succulents offers a soft, sparkling support, and her new patchouli green finish sets the stage for the true drama, her living table top. Like any great console table, she can support a favorite collection of geodes or nautical floats, or seasonal objects, or even a beloved favorite family photo. And what's that over there on the right? With her sturdy succulents and pebble ground cover, she can even light the darkness with a lovely table lamp. A true inside-outside living piece of functional art. Well, what about that other green that's always a factor in any project? Well, the piece itself was $10. The succulent stencils were 13. Go figure, we live in a crazy world. The paint cost me $19.99, we'll round up to 20. So with a little extra for sandpaper and that glaze I didn't keep and top coat, the cost of the furniture redesign was $58. But what of all those lovely plants? Well, like I said, I did splurge. I bought 22, yes, 22 succulents at about an average of about $4 a plant. So that was about $90. Then with some plastic liner, a bag of soil, and those pebbles, I'll need to add in another $25, putting my grand total for this creation right at $173. So what did I sell it for? Well, I didn't sell it, of course, of course. I'm sure you knew that though, right? You knew, you had to know. I couldn't sell it, there's, there's no way. You all knew, you knew. <laughs> Here's the thing, August is my birthday month and so this was kind of a little birthday present to myself, but I was curious to know how something like this might sell. And of course, I wanted to give you as much information as I could, so I sent some pictures and asked around. The response was overwhelmingly positive. Wow, what a neat idea. Oh my God, that's gorgeous. I would buy one from you. I have no idea what it would cost. Nobody wants to talk about money. Here's an important detail though, if you'd like to attempt this project for yourself or maybe even to try to sell, if you wanna do it as thrifty as possible and not splurge on all those plants, 
check your local marketplace listings for used plants. You might be able to find plants for about half of what you would spend at a nursery and occasionally you might even get them for free or at least dirt cheap. I'm sorry, I had to. Maybe I'll come back to that selling idea someday, but for now, I'm just going to enjoy this piece. I do hope that you feel encouraged and inspired to repurpose an unwanted object with a missing piece. It could be that the very piece that is missing gives you the space you need to grow some new inspiration. Thank you so much for joining me, my friends. It is so great to be back. I will see you next time for more Furniture Fables. Oh,